Hey, everybody. And what's, that up, what's up, what's <laughs> uh, hey, up? Oh, healthy, healthy's in the house. What's up, J. Cruz? This is an exciting week, guys. Heist week. Yeah. Heist week, heist week, heist week. I'm very excited about it. Who didn't yeah. have, like, one of their first adult movies be a heist movie? Like, everybody. That was, you know what I mean? Especially yeah. when you, if you had, like, a like a 60-year-old grandfather, that's all they watched. Yeah. That and cowboy <laughs> movies. Who didn't have, like, one of their first adult uh, We are going to make some announcements. I'm going to hold on the announcements here until we get a little bit more of an audience so that we're not just speaking to the air. So uh, we'll probably uh, we'll see how many people are in here after we do our first round of films, and we'll go. We'll make a go from there. All right. Did you just call Jay Cruz the air? That was pretty mean, Joe. That well, was pretty messed no. Up. no. Well, he's the air that I breathe, Joe. He is the, <laughs> he's the wind beneath Joe's wings. That's right. <laughs> All right. So um, this is Eric's theme for the week. So Eric is going to kick us off by discussing the first film, and then Eric, you just pass it off to to me or or uh, Bearded Life Joe, and we will get rolling. All righty. Well, the first movie I'm going to go with is the Jason Statham 2008 movie, The Bank Job, which was very loosely based based on a true story, and basically in the movie. They get hired by this really beautiful girl. <laughs> hey, man, no Jar Jar. <laughs> um, uh, they get uh, a friend, an ex-girlfriend of Jason Statham's gets busted with some drugs. And the government needs some pictures of Princess Margaret, who is getting a little busy down in... Uh, Trinidad, Tobago, whatever, and you got mm -hmm. some blackmail pictures taken. And so they wanted to recover them and they found out what box they were in and this what safe box they were in at a bank. And basically Jason Statham puts together a crew and it's all about them robbing the bank. Now about the only thing true when it came to it was uh, during the robbery they were communicating with their lookout and somebody on a ham radio started picking up that conversation and okay. started calling police department saying, Hey, somebody's robbing a bank. And that's about as based on truth as it gets, <laughs> but great movie. Um, one thing that kind of got me into heist movies and technically this isn't a heist movie, but I consider it a caper movie would be the great escape. Okay. You know, I mean, one of my favorite movies of all times. I remember watching that as a kid with my dad and, you know, so the whole caper thing brings back great memories and heist movies and everything. That's the primary reason I chose this topic for this week. Nice. So I'm about to say something really messed up to Eric <laughs> with Eric's choice. This is my least favorite Jason Statham movie. <laughs> That's I'm sorry, man. I don't know why. It just never. And this is where like different tastes, different people, right? We've all got our different styles, things we like, yeah. things we don't like. This movie, I don't know what it was about it. It just didn't. And me and my brother at this time were huge Jason Statham fans, right? He's just becoming one of those action stars. And I was big on the Van Dams and the Seagals during that era and all that stuff. I'm so sorry. I'm becoming a huge <laughs> fan of his. And this movie just didn't do it, man. I tried it, man. Eric, man, I'm, I'm glad somebody enjoyed it because it wasn't me, brother. Well, also, mom, you know, my mom was born and raised in England. So I always have a soft spot for movies that take place in England or have English actors or whatever. Nice. You know, I mean, my grandfather uh, worked for the British Corps of Engineers and built Bailey Bridges which is basically what helped them pull off the D-Day landing. And uh, he also repaired bridges after World War II around England. So soft spot in my heart for, you know, seeing older London and things like that. Yeah. Have you seen the movie, Joe? No, no. I um, I tend to stay away from Jason. What's his name? Um, Statham. Statham. Statham, yeah, I just he's not my vibe. Although I do enjoy him in um, 
snatch, you know, but he's not a guy that's going to pull me into a, uh, a movie. Okay. Call that's me fair enough. That's fair enough. He's definitely, um, you have to be really big into like those action star kind of guys. And yeah, I guess again, maybe the era I grew up in, you know, the Stallones, all those things were happening during when I was younger. So I still hold a place for action movies. Like I'm, Still a huge Vin Diesel fan to this day. I, the Riddick movies have actually gotten worse as they've gone on, but I still watch every one of them. Yeah. <laughs> right on, right on. Anything right, else? So, why don't we go ahead and go to Mr. Barbado Joe? Okay, all right. I've got three eclectic choices. Well, one of them is not too eclectic, but the other two are. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna start with the heist film that involves no money. OK. Um, and I don't know how many of you have seen this film. I hope a bunch. And if not. Yeah. Good. Eric. If you haven't, then hopefully you will see. And that's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, um, written by the great playwright David Mamet. Um, it is. Hey, how about I pick this thing instead? Uh huh. <laughs> Can you guys see that poster? Yep. Yes, I can. Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. So, um, David Mamet, who's one of the great American playwrights and who also wrote the screenplay, look at this cast right here Pacino, Jack Lemon, Alec Baldwin, Ed Harris, Alan Arkin, Kevin Spacey, wow. and Jonathan Price. If you don't know Jonathan Price, you do. You just may not know his name. He's one of the, the heavy hitter English actors in the past 30 years, in my opinion. Um, so this is a film, and I'm going to just do, um, I like the short, succinct IMDb background. So just real quickly, I'm going to tell you what this, this thing is about. Um, I think, or maybe I didn't pull up this one. Uh, maybe I didn't. That's okay. I wrote a paper on it in, the ma in my master's study, so I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, initially, the director of this film, didn't want to do it because he's like, it's just going to be like a play. What am I going to do? And that was uh, James Foley. And then he got coerced into doing it. The film was made in um, made for twelve point five million in ninety two. It actually lost two million. Uh, I can see it not being a great theater film, but being a film lovers of film or acting will will completely dig. Um, the idea is there is this um, real estate agency, and then they cold call. OK, um, Pacino is played or Ricky Roma is Al Pacino and he is the stud salesman. He's got all the good lines. He looks good. He dresses like Ric Flair in the 80s. He is the <laughs> stud. Shelly Levine is Jack Lemon. His daughter, I believe it is, is dying of some disease. So he uh, wants to, to help her out. But he is an old school salesman and the new sales tactics have kind of passed him by. But he still has some favor kind of in the company because they remember his glory days. Um, Alan Arkin is George Aronow, who is a guy who just got into real estate and he's not very good at it. Dave Moss is Ed Harris, who is just this surly, sour kind of guy. He feels that the world has screwed him over and he's constantly bitching and arguing. Um, John Williamson is uh, the character Kevin Spacey plays. It's actually a bit role. He is the manager of the real estate office. So he's kind of a company guy. He's not one of the salesmen. No one likes him because he answers to the company. But uh, Spacey doesn't get a ton of screen time. And the, the role that everyone knows this movie for, it's been parodied on Saturday Night Live with Elves, is Alec Baldwin's um, cameo and monologue with Blake. Um that role is not in the actual movie or the play. It's made for the movie. And Baldwin absolutely crushes that role. Um, absolutely. I'm going to take the share off of this, guys. Absolutely crushes that role to the point where when people talk Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, they think of Alec Baldwin. It's worth watching the movie just to see his monologue in this film. Coffee is for closers. Coffee is for closers. <laughs> First place in the monthly thing is a new Cadillac. Second place, a set of steak knives. You don't want to know what third place is. So Baldwin comes in as, as the, the, the hatchet man for the company. He's a stud salesman. He tells Ed Harris his watch is worth more than Ed Harris. I mean, he just comes in to, to let them know, hey, we got the new Glenn Gary leads. And everyone wants these Glenn Gary leads because, you know, it's prime 
uh, property and they, they think they're working with old shit leads doing their cold calling. So the heist is these Glengarry leads. They try and heist. Well, a couple of the characters try and heist the Glengarry leads. Now, I, I want I don't want to do any spoilers for this. The acting, the acting was so good that none of the guys, they filmed it kind of in order and you didn't necessarily have to be on set at the same time because a lot of the guys, a lot of the scenes are just one or two actors. But there's such an all-star ensemble here that a guy like Pacino, even if it wasn't his day, would show up to watch Harris act. And a guy like Arkin, even though it wasn't his day, would show up, you know, so they would take their off days and they would still come and, and watch these guys perform and do their thing. Um, I think that's about it as far as all of that goes. I, I highly, it, it is, um, it, all the action takes place in this real estate minus a couple little things. You get a couple scenes at a Chinese restaurant. You actually go on a sit or a real estate um, um, where Shelly Levine tries to cold call. and But it's all internal conflict. It's all internal drama. And the heist itself, uh, I'm not going to say whether it's successful or not successful, but it's a heist that you don't usually see. No weapons, no money, no jewels, no gold. Just these leads. Uh, an absolutely fantastic movie. Never seen it. Oh, you got it. <laughs> no. It's rare that I come up with something that you're like, never seen it. That's one you need to put on your list. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Uh, I'll have to get to it. I've, unfor I've never seen it, unfortunately. I have heard of it before today, but I've just never actually sat down and watched it. Hey, boys. We got the chat's filling up very nicely. Nice. Yeah, hit that like button like it owes you money or what have you. Good to see all you guys in here. Fantastic. Um, I don't know why my thing is wig and Joe. I'm going to try and get my share to work a little bit better for your movie. I'm going to hand it over to Joe and let him do his first movie, and then we're well, going to do some announcements. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Um, I was going to say when it comes to uh, Alec Baldwin's monologue, uh, my second favorite SNL skit was a Christmas show yeah. where he was the head – cobbler elf right and <laughs> just did the whole you know the whole tape you know you know where he's complaining you know talking about the people complaining about the bad leads well then with with all the uh, santa's elves he's talking about you know them complaining about the tools they have to use and everything yeah and obviously my favorite alec baldwin sorry night live sweaty balls now, he also screws up on that because the ABC in the skit was always be cobbling, but mm -hmm. he would always be closing. So he yep. screwed up his line because probably because he so thinks of the, the Glenn Gary uh, line being so out there and in front. Um, I, I was thinking of one other thing, Eric, when you said that, and now I lost it. Okay. Sorry, I didn't get you. I forgot that you had seen it, Eric. I just think of this as being a movie that not too many people have seen. Thank you for commenting. Uh, Joe? Oh, my turn. All right. So uh, my movie is the 2013 movie, Now You See Me. Um, this movie had a lot, a lot of talk heading into it because of the cast they put together really here. I mean, the cast they put together for this thing is pretty huge. I mean, you've got Jesse Eisenberg, Mark Ruffalo, Woody Harrelson, Ilsa Fisher, Dave Franco, Morgan Freeman, Michael Caine, even Commons got a role in this damn movie. Like, they really rolled out with a pretty big cast for this movie. And they didn't give you too much leading up to it other than you had these. It looked like there was something to do with a magician. That's basically what they did. So the basic story here is essentially you have four magicians all out there working, doing their own sticks in their own way. And some of them are bigger than others. Some of them have gotten real big time. Some of them are still just street level. And they all get contacted by this group called the Eye. And the Eye is like this legendary group behind the scenes that I guess controls a bunch of magicians and has them do different jobs and expose people and different things, right? They all get contacted and they all get asked to be part of the eye and they come together to become a group called the horsemen. 
and they start doing shows together, but their shows are just really, they're, they're essentially what magicians do, right? It's misdirection. Well, they're misdirecting you to watch them on stage while in reality, they've already pulled off a heist behind the scenes. And they've robbed multiple different banks, and they've gotten out of there without anybody even noticing they were there in the first place. So, of course, because they're magicians, everybody's going, this is real magic, right? They're using real magic somehow, some way. And you find out really that it's just they've taken the magician trade and turned it into the ultimate bank robber handbook, if you will. Like, okay, we'll use double mirrors here. We'll do this. We'll do that. And they won't even know we weren't there. They use burn card paper in the one bank vault. It's just everything they do is so precise, so thought out. But none of it is their idea. It's all coming from the eye who's telling them exactly what they're going to do. Telling them step for step, right? So... Mark Ruffalo's character works for the FBI. He gets the call. He has to go stop these guys. He has to go find out how to stop them because even though they know where they're going to be performing, the crowds are getting so big, it's hard to get to them. And then when they do get there, once again, magic hits and poof, they're gone. They disappear. No sign of them anywhere. So the only thing he can think of is he goes to Morgan Freeman's character. Now, Morgan Freeman's character is actually a magician who never made it as a magician. So then went the other road of debunking magicians. He would show off all the secrets and show you why these tricks they were doing and things like that weren't real. The amazing so, Randy kind of like. Yes, yes. And it's just a very, very good, done, very well shot movie, very well done movie in my opinion. Um, it wasn't a critic favorite, that's for sure. But you know me, I don't really side with the critics all that often. I really enjoyed this one. And the standout character for me in this was Woody Harrelson's character because it's kind of old, little a little cynical, things like that. But he's funny. And he just, everything he does is easy. You know, he just easily delivers everything. Every way he talks, the way he comes across just so well done and again the cast from top to bottom huge absolutely huge and um you know me i like to bring some facts right the yep. budget on this 75 million dollar budget it grossed 351 million worldwide wow so it definitely was the reason why they did a part two and why they're even talking about a part three so I thoroughly enjoyed the film. I even enjoyed the second one, although the girl they got to replace Isla Fisher in the second one, eh, I, well, whatever. I kind of got a crush on Isla, so maybe that's why I felt that way. Um, but yeah, that's it, guys. I don't know if either one of you guys saw the movie. Another one yep. I haven't seen. Um, the one, I I enjoyed it a lot. You know, I like how the cop teams up with the uh, uh, debunker on how to uh, catch these guys and gal. Um, but the actor that really surprised me, and it was Dave Franco. You know, his older brother, great actor, James Franco. But <clears throat> this was one of Dave's bigger roles uh, early in his career. And I thought he, you know, played his role great. I thought it was very clever. Um how they did everything and then you know kind of like with oceans they kind of show what how they achieved the different illusions um slash heists so uh always enjoy that aspect and i thought um sorry cam but i thought it was a little more clever than oceans 11 because ocean 11 was a remake and granted they've made tons of money but i thought uh now you see me it was a little more clever take on the big, big bank heist and everything. Yeah. And I'd love to give you guys more, but if you give away too much about this film, it absolutely yeah. spoils everything. Right. So I really don't want to give away too much, but there are some great twists and turns in this film as well. Some things you just don't see coming at all, not even in the least bit, just very well done. Mark Ruffalo also delivers an amazing performance in the film. 
one of his breakout performances, I thought. One of the ones that made people look at him a little differently. Just a really well done film. Oh, yeah. Anything else you wanted to say, Eric? No, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And yeah, of course, the sequel wasn't as good as the first one, but it was a worthwhile watch. Uh, I didn't bother spending the money on it in the theaters because I didn't think it was going to be that good. But, you know, I put it on my Netflix queue and, you know, so as soon as it came out on DVD, uh, I, you know, I got it and I enjoyed it. Okay. Um, the, the, the Void ate Joe. So um, we'll be, luckily he just did his though. So we have a little time to get him back in before there he is. Before we get into the, um, the next my round apologies, gentlemen. The the <laughs> my entire phone froze. I I couldn't tell if we were still live or what was going on. <laughs> Joe just said, "Now you don't," says Cam. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of announcements. Um, number one, when we decided to start this uh, this live, we just defaulted to my channel. But now that we've you know had a, a few episodes under our belts and we're up and running for twenty twenty one. It, it, this is like one third, one third, one third. We all have equal ownership of this thing. So we are going to make sure that, you know, uh, Eric is, is got a channel and he's, um, you know, doing some new things than what he had done in the past. Obviously Joe has a channel. So what we will do is we all choose a week, a theme for a week. And then the last couple of times we've had kind of a buffer before we do the next choice, which we'll also have this time, but whosoever week it is, it will go to their channel and we'll make sure we post that on Instagram. Like, you know, Eric's week, go to sober chef, Eric's channel, whatever like that. So when we're hyping this, so, you know, say, so next week is actually my week. So it'll stay here. And then we'll get, we'll give it to one of the other guys. We'll give it to Eric or Joe for our buffer week, which also I really want to dis uh, discuss because what we're going to do is have you guys who have been regulars in the chat, jump on here and join us and pick some films yourselves. And um, I don't know what I called it initially, but it's kind of like an audience appreciation and we've picked the first three. And if it goes well, I know there, I already have a second three and even a third three in my head to throw past the guys, but uh, Disney Beardsman will be on here and he's going to do sports films with Joe. And so what that means is Disney Beardsman will choose three films. Joe will watch them and the two of them will discuss and then we'll kick Disney's ass out of here. <laughs> and then Eric is going to be on here with Camel Cam, and they're going to discuss teen films. Um, and then uh, Cam will get on here, and, and he and Eric will kind of run the thing. And we're not going to do it one at a time. We're going to do a pair is going to discuss their theme the whole way through, and then we'll move to the next pair. And then I get Waltimus Prime. He and I are going to discuss mystery. Walt has already picked his films, so I'll watch him, and Walt will lead the discussion more or less. And you know, and and so that's how it's going to go in two weeks. All right, and hopefully, like I said, we'll do more of these because I'd like to get uh, more of you guys on here. Those of you that want to take part in this, and and uh, you know, just get your ideas, your whole films, because you know, Cam even said tonight. He said some if something wasn't on here, he was going to riot. So it gets you the chance to have your voice, your say. You pick the theme, even. We don't pick it. You just tell us what to watch, and we'll join you and have a good old time, okay? Um, so that will be in two weeks. Uh, next week, we'll be here, and it's going to be Directors Part 1. We're each going to choose a director whose stuff we like, and that's what we're going to roll with next week. Okay? You mean two weeks from today? Uh, so yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm making us weekly. Thank you, Eric. So really, the the um, the audience appreciation isn't for a month, right? Since we're bi-weekly, so we won't be getting to that till like mid March. All right. Okay. Any questions from my boys in the chat before we start round two? I'm sorry, in the stream before we start round two. Or is everything good? I'm good to go. Okay. So we will let you know whether it's going to be on Eric's or Joe's when we do that audience appreciation because it'll be on one of their channels. All right. All right. So then that means round two electric boogaloo, Eric, let's do it. All right. Uh, my next one, I just kind of stumbled across this one on Netflix. It was a Netflix movie and I ended up really enjoying it. And let me just one second. Got to go to a screenshot. <laughs> Okay, uh, is Triple Frontier. 
And Triple Frontier is, like I say, it's a Netflix movie. And it's about these guys that were on the same. Uh, they never really said what branch they were in, but they were elite servicemen and did a lot of kind of covert stuff. And uh, it stars Ben Affleck. Uh, you know him from everything. Uh, Oscar Isaac. I like uh, Oscar Isaac. Yeah, Oscar Isaac. Uh, my favorite role of his is Ex Machina. Um, and Charlie Hoonan, oh. which most people know from Sons of Anarchy. Um, I loved him in King Arthur. Um, but those are the big three names. And Oscar Isaac is associated with the CIA at the beginning of this movie. And there's a big drug cartel lord that supposedly has this retreat where he's got millions and millions and millions of dollars stored. And uh, he talks his old team into doing not the heist, but to do the recon and develop the plan for the government agency and Oscar Isaac to be the lead on it. Well, the whole time Oscar Isaac's thinking to himself, screw them all the skills, everything we've done for our country for pennies and it's our turn. Mm. So he convinces his guys to do it. And uh, I'm not going to do any spoilers or anything like that. It's a great movie and it's on Netflix. So, you know, if you're using your third cousin's Netflix account, it's not costing you a penny to watch it. <laughs> um, Give that but, title again, Eric. What? Give the title again. Triple Frontier. Triple Frontier. And uh, like I say, it's on Netflix. Uh, just so I'm going to put it in the chat. I'll have to look that one up, Eric. I've never seen it. Me either. But Netflix has been pumping out a lot of movies lately, and it, it does get hard to keep up with them, honestly. Holy cow. It's like live streams in the beard community. Yeah. Yeah. There's just a new one coming out like every day. You're like, is this one worth watching or not? There's so many of them. And I remember about 60% of the Netflix movies are Adam Sandler movies. So we know Joe's happy. <laughs> oh. Don't don't complain about that. That's fine. I'm not complaining. That's absolutely fine, Eric. Yeah, I, mean, I know. That's why it's so that you'd be happy. <laughs> Adam Sandler should have his own streaming device, in my opinion. That's what I think. He should have his Sandler TV. Holy crap, that's amazing. Somebody get me in touch with Adam Sandler right now. <laughs> Let me let me get some digits for you, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, so it's got a little more action, um, gunfire and stuff like that than a lot of heist movies. You know, it's definitely either going to be taking this uh, hideout or whatever by force, but like I say, they're all you know um, veterans and of. Uh, some elite force they never say which one but you know i'm guessing they were rangers or green berets i don't think they were seals just because of one of the early scenes in the movie but i think it's worth a watch um and it's like i say it's one i discovered recently and i really enjoyed it awesome all right so now we'll go to joe all right um my next choice is, I'm assuming there's a Quentin Tarantino fan or two in the house, in the audience. And I know Joe's a fan and I'm a fan. Um, I'm not doing a Quentin Tarantino movie. Eric's a fan. But um, I, I, I threw this for my, my panel members as well as you guys, because I wasn't sure if they knew how important this film was to Quentin Tarantino and to his filmmaking craft. Um and he likes all kinds of films. He's not just a snobby, like, you know, American classics or whatever. He likes B-movies. He likes all kinds of different uh, shows. But when we want to talk about some a movie that really influenced films like Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs structurally, we have to go to the first feature-length film that the great Stanley Kubrick did called The Killing. All right. Um, now, this I, some of you younger kids, you know, this was made 
a while ago. And yes, you can hit me with the old man jokes, but this one predates even me by many a year. But this is made in 1956, okay? Um, it's shot in 24 days for about 320 k and even though the critics loved it, it lost about 130 k So it was not even a big moneymaker. Uh, it was filmed in America, which is rare for Kubrick, because eventually he goes over and starts filming everything exclusively in England. Uh, here is the idea for the killing. Now, the killing isn't talking about um, murdering a person. It's talking about, you know, when you make a killing, you know, you when you earn a lot of money. So after just being released from a five-year stint in prison, Johnny Clay has assembled a five-man team, including, including two insiders, to carry out what he estimates will be a $2 million, which is about $20 million in our money, uh, $2 million heist at Lansdowne Racetrack. That take minus expenses is going to be split five ways. Besides Johnny, though, none of the men truly are criminals in the typical sense. In addition to the other four team members, Johnny has hired two men external to the team to carry out specific functions for a flat fee. And the other four who will not meet the two man for hire or know who they are while the two man for hire will not be told of the bigger picture. So there's a core five heist. And then this guy, Johnny Clay, hires out two guys to do specific roles that are going to aid in the success of the heist. OK, um, uh, a couple interesting trivia tidbits is um, I, I gave you some of the money, but actually one one. Um, big trivia tidbit is this is the film debut of Rodney Dangerfield. Uh, he he doesn't speak. He doesn't have a speaking role or anything like that. He just does a little like double take look see at something that's going on. And what he's looking at is one of those two guys who who does a side job for the heist. Joe is actually this guy who I'm about to put up on the screen. And Joe, when you see him, what I want you to say, say, um, uh, so let me stop that one real quick. What I want you to say is, first thing is what you think his occupation would be when he's not filming or appearing in films. Okay. Okay. Oh, dude, he's, he's George the Animal Steel. He looks a lot like George the Animal Steel. Yeah. Uh, he's not. He's not George. However. He was a professional wrestler in the 40s and 50s uh, by the name of Kola Coriani. I think he was Romanian. He actually okay. trained, he trained Antonio Roca and worked a lot with Bruno San Martino for a few years. Um, but what his, his job is to go when they're at the racetrack is to create a commotion. And you see that it's taking like six police guys to hold him back. And he's doing all these wrestling moves circa the 40s and 50s. His whole thing was he got about two minutes screen time just to beat up cops using like hip drags. And, you know, he does a a, um, a gorilla spin or a gorilla press slam and he does an airplane spin. and just does all these wrestling things. So I thought that was kind of cool for those of us here. Um, the other guy who does this, the, the specific role who isn't part of the take is an actor Tarantino wanted to work with. Um, and this dude creeped me out. His job is to be a sniper. All right. But he's killing a horse. He's not killing a person. He's killing a horse since they're at this racetrack. Um, the actor's name and there he is. And it, it, I did some reading on this guy. He's supposed to be a pretty interesting guy um, as far as like a, as an individual. The actor's name is Timothy Carey. His um, his uh, uh, character name is Nikki. But when when Johnny Clay goes to visit him to hire him, just his whole persona and his on screen presence is unsettling. And even that smile is kind of unsettling. And then he goes to the track and he's waited on the guy who's in charge of the parking is a black guy. And he treats the black guy. Remember, this is 56. He treats the right. black guy rather nicely. And he goes through and he's parked outside of the racetrack, but so he can see and take out a particular horse. Well, this black guy, because of how nicely he was treated, came back a couple of times. He's like, hey, here's a program. Um, I thought you might want it. And he's like, oh, thanks. And then the black guy comes back again. And when the black guy comes back a third time, Carrie, who's getting ready, or Nikki, who's getting ready to shoot this horse, has had it and says, look, N-word, get out of here. And that is just like, whoa. 
because everything just spins and the black guy is like, okay, I see how it is. And it should, it just takes it in a completely different direction. Um, so this guy, I don't know a lot about his filmography, but he's a very interesting dude who's been in some trouble. Kind of reminded me a bit of Lawrence Tierney from Reservoir Dogs, um, Joe, a kind of guy that had a bit of a rep and uh, right. was problematic. But he, I want to see more stuff that he's in because he just has this stage presence about him that's very, very uh, spooky and magnetic. Now, sure. why this film, why Tarantino loves this film is um, – before, before we get there, some of the other people that are in the crew, right? You got Johnny Clay, who was played by um, uh, uh, Spencer. I forget his name, dang it. I didn't write it down. Anyway, he was a big time actor. That's the whole reason the movie decided to to uh, push the funding for it, because this guy was a big time actor. Tall, good looking kind of guy, but a little bit older, a little out of his heyday. Um, there's a guy named George who's a betting clerk, and he's kind of a sad sack, and he's married to a femme fatale named Sherry who's cheating on him with a character named Val Cannon, who's like a small time hood. And she tells wow. him about this heist when no one was supposed to talk about it because George, her husband tells him about this heist. Then there's Mike, who's a racetrack bartender. Then there's an older guy who is financing this. And there is definitely some, you could definitely read. And remember this is 56. You can definitely read some homosexual tones with his behavior towards Johnny, the leader of the of the ring, of of, of the ring, of the um of the um uh, high string. I don't want to get into all the spoilers and everything again because how it ends, I will say this: uh, they get away with the money. Okay, I will say that they pull off the heist, um, but I'm not going to go beyond that. But how the reason Tarantino and loves this film so much is the structure. Apparently, not a lot of people had done this before, but after the whole heist team is is gotten together, they have to meet at the racetrack at a certain time. This is very time specific, and and all the things they do have to go off within a mere matter of seconds. They don't have a lot of wiggle room. And what Tarantino does is he takes every person. And, and it's two o'clock yes, and then someone goes back three hours and we see what they're doing. And then they get to the racetrack by two. And then we flash to another character and we go back a few hours and see what they're doing. And then they get to the racetrack by two. So it's this nonlinear storytelling. Once we as viewers are at the racetrack, we're like, okay, things are going to happen. And then Tarantino populates all the heist members and what they did at the start of their day and what things might have happened before he actually brings them in. So if you have watched Reservoir Dogs and you see there's a little bit of non-linear storytelling or particularly Pulp Fiction, where there's a ton of non-linear storytelling where we're going in and out of time, this is something that Kubrick does here that's um, very, very effective. And the last thing I, want, I wanted to show you before I hand it off is the, the, the main guy who has to go into where the, all the winnings are and grab all the money, who's Johnny Clay, he has a mask that to me... I think the the uh, makers of uh, Dark Knight, um, the one with the Joker, is that Dark? What what is that one called? Dark Knight Returns. Dark Knight Rises. Dark. No, that's that's the Dark Knight. That's just the Dark Knight. The just first the one's Knight. Batman Begins, then Dark Knight, then Dark Knight Rises. Okay. okay. If you remember the the henchmen and how the film started, who were robbing the bank, and they had those clown masks. Um, uh, um, Johnny puts on a clown mask when he gets inside and when you look at it and see it in the film it's it's pretty now it's a clown mask and there's lots of them out there but the look of it reminded me a ton of the clown masks that were used in that Batman film this by the way is the Criterion Collection DVD cover for, for the killing by this film um, it, it feels for those of you who have watched other Kubrick films, Clockwork, Clockwork Orange, 2001, Space Odyssey, um, Dr. Strange Love, The Shining. It's got some elements, but it's actually pretty straightforward and not as, um, I guess, mind warpy, mind bendy, mind fucky as as his later stuff will be. All right. Uh, well, have either of you guys seen this? I haven't seen it, but I've seen quite a few Kubrick movies and Clockwork Orange is uh, one of my favorite all time movie soundtracks. Um, the score was just wonderful in that movie as well as just uh, it was a dark humor that I enjoyed and 
Yeah, so I, I haven't I'll seen it. Work. I haven't <laughs> seen it, but I did see an interview where Tarantino talked about how much this film had influenced some of his decisions and things like that when it came to his filmmaking. So because of that, I had always wanted to see it, but it's not a film that like is just on your cable on a regular basis at this point, you know? It, so, it is on Amazon Prime. You have to pay for is it. Is it? Yeah, really? Yeah, it is on Amazon okay. Prime. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I will say this. I mean, you really have to be, um, it's dated. It's a 1956 film. It feels dated. Um, there are some slow moments, but when we actually get into that heist and ride it out to the end, and even a little before as we're preparing, as we know the heist is coming, we're on the day of the heist, I think it's very enjoyable. And that scene, like I said, with the sniper and the, and the black eye at the racetrack, that, that's a, a great bit as well. But there are going to be some slower bits, and it's you know it's now it's a 64-year-old film, so some conventions are a little different, and the storytelling might not be what we are used to as being younger guys than that. Okay. All you, Joe. Oh, that's right. My turn. All right. So uh, my second one, we're going to 2012 here, boys and girls. And we are going to a movie with one of my favorite lines ever. It's simple. It's basic. But it's, you think you're the only guy that owns a gun? And I mean, I know it sounds simple, but you had it. You got to grow up where I grew up to understand that the context to that is like, you're not the only one walking around here. It's a tough guy. And we're talking about uh, 2012's Contraband with Mark Wahlberg. This movie, when it first came out, caught a lot of flack, actually, because I think people assumed this was going to be a high-action, high-paced Mark Wahlberg film. And that's not really what it is. It's more of a slow-build story about the process of smuggling in things basically through the port. And a lot of it is just about Mark Wahlberg's character, which is called Chris Faraday and his family and their essentially lineage of being the best smugglers in the area. They're, they're number one. His father was great at it before him. He's become great at it, but he's gotten out, you know, done the rare thing here. He's gotten out without serving prison time, without getting in any real trouble. He's been able to walk away, and he's living a normal life now until his brother-in-law, you know, you can't, you can't choose the family you marry into, right? You just you marry a girl, and that's that. Well, he's not that good at this, and he's doing a job for another guy who absolutely steals the role in this, and steals the whole movie to me. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the guy's name. One second, Giovanni Rebesi. Rebesi. Am I saying Rebisi. that right? Yeah, he's the one with the guy holding the gun, Joe. The yep. picture I sent you that you asked yep. me. All right, he plays Tim Briggs. He is a he's a drug dealer, and he's the guy that that Wahlberg's brother-in-law is doing the smuggling for. This guy right here, the role he puts out, the performance he puts out in this movie is absolutely outstanding mm -hmm. you really got the the idea that he was a i mean how do i put this? he's a wannabe tough guy the whole film he's not really a badass his brother was the badass so now he's trying to fill those shoes and prove to everyone that he really is a tough guy he really is a hard ass from boston he can do these things and the one way he does that is by pulling the gun on people. And that's where that line comes from, where Wahlberg knocks him down and pulls his own gun and says, you think he's the only guy in Boston with a gun? Like, is that how this works around here? So essentially, this kid gets in trouble, right? So now Chris Faraday, Mark Wahlberg's character, has to come out of retirement and do one last job. Otherwise, Briggs is going to kill his brother-in-law because he just lost, as he put it, I can't remember the exact number, maybe Eric does, but I believe he said it was 750 grand to me. That's how much that stuff is worth in the streets to me, 750,000. Because Wahlberg was going to give him the buy money. He said, I'll give you whatever you spent to go and get this stuff. And he goes, no, 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 no. That's worth 750 grand to me. That's what I need from this. So Wahlberg and his best friend, Sebastian, played by Ben Foster, who... I like Ben Foster in so many movies, man. Yeah. But this was the one film 
bro, I felt like he phoned it in a little bit. Ah, uh, it's a pisser. Yeah, I feel like he just... I don't feel like this was the real Ben Foster performances we've all come to know and love, where he is that character. He is that guy in that moment. Where... Joe, someone on the... There you are. Yeah, sorry. My apologies. Somebody was trying to call me. Uh, somebody tell Chris from that channel to be named later. I'm on a live stream, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> be here, too. So, Foster, again, he um, he just doesn't deliver that performance. I don't know if you guys have seen Alpha Dogs or, or some of the other roles he's done where you thought, like, man, what a freaking performance by that guy. Like, he nailed that role. This one... And again, he's playing Wahlberg's sidekick basically in the film. So maybe that's why I felt that way because Wahlberg commanded so much of the screen and, and all those things that Foster kind of gets lost in the shuffle here. But it was really sad to me because, again, such a great actor, delivers such great performances. And this was the one time that performance just didn't shine through for us, unfortunately. Um, so again, Wahlberg has to go on this one last job. He's got to pull it off. He gets on his dad's old ship. He even goes to see his dad in prison to get him on the ship. But he's married now, man. He's got kids. He's got a. He's got his own job. Like he's got his own business. He's got a lot to lose now. It's a different world for him. This isn't him when he was, you know, twenty years old and had nothing to lose. He's a grown man now. So now he's doing this in a different way. It's no longer oh, if I get caught, whatever. Because at one point when he's trying to get his boarding license. <laughs> The woman's like, have you ever been convicted of like espionage, grand theft auto, this, that, that? And he goes, all at the same time? <laughs> like it wasn't a, like, yeah, no, I never got caught for any of those things. It was no, wait, like together or period. You know what I mean? Yeah. So again, just a great, great, great performance. Great movie. So nice to see the way they kind of showed you. Like, yes, this is Wahlberg's, this is his world, right? He knows what he's doing. But the added pressure of now he's got his wife, who was actually played by Kate Beckinsale at home, with the kids, like, you could see the difference. He couldn't just make these rash decisions anymore. He couldn't be loose with it, like, well, whatever, if the cops find it, no big deal. No. Now it was, okay, well, if the cops find it, my brother-in-law is dead because we didn't deliver, and I'm going to jail... And my wife and kids have nobody to take care of them. And you find out at the end, and I don't want to throw away a huge spoiler here, but man, to find out exactly what you found out at the end of this movie about his sidekick, it was just all, and I think that's part of it too. Foster winds up becoming such a big part of the ending, but he just, again, Joe, man, it just wasn't that Foster that I know and love, that guy that just delivers these amazing amazing performances that you're like wow man he just killed that role mm. this was not one of those roles man unfortunately um this was not one of Wahlberg's favorites by the critics it only most sites have it at 50 or 49 Rotten Tomatoes has it as a 51 uh the budget was 25 mil it made 96 million and a fun little side story to this the director wanted all the driving in the movie to be authentic. They didn't want any green screens or any of that stuff. They wanted the actors to really drive, right? Mm -hmm. First day of filming, there's a scene where Kate Beckinsale is putting the kids in the car to go for a ride, and she puts the kids in and then turns, and they're all looking at her. She goes, oh, didn't my agent tell you I don't drive? We need somebody to drive the car. <laughs> so just a funny little thing there. And yeah. again, I love this movie. Absolutely love it. I don't know if have you seen it, Joe? I haven't, but it's on my list, on my library list. It's on my library list. Okay. Which means I feel like the biggest complaint about it really is that people expected more action. Honestly, I think that's yeah. what it was going into this. People expected a lot more fast-paced, hard-hitting action. That's not what this is. It's all about the smuggling world. And really, they show you some ins and outs because they brought real smugglers onto the set yeah. to teach them things. Right. Technical consultants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it was pretty. I thought it was really cool, man. I really did. Uh, one of my favorite parts <clears throat> is when he explains how you smuggle a Ferrari. I yep. love that scene. Yep, I love that scene. 
But uh, yeah. yeah, how do you Great. smuggle in a whole Ferrari? It's simple. Yeah. You let them impound the shell. You take the guts. Then the guy goes and buys the shell for like you know two thousand, and then you sell them back all the important parts of the Ferrari. It was just beautiful. And Eric, come on, man! If you saw the movie, the part where he's trying to explain to Tariq about salt and water, mm -hmm. he's like, "Didn't you take science, bitch? Don't you know that salt melts in water?" He's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I've seen this movie. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times it it's one of the ones that was in the rotation um, that I used to, before I got done right now, thing, I, uh, you know, drank a lot and all that fun stuff. And so going to sleep was always hard for me. So I always had a movie playing and contraband was one of them. Um, Sin city, you know, just big old boss, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, so even though contraband wasn't out at that time yet, I was in that habit of watching movies when I went to bed. So when it came out, I got it on DVD and I thought it was a great role for yeah. Wahlberg. It was oh, yeah. you know, more to show his acting chops than his action chops. And I personally, I mean, Transformers with him was okay, but I think he's a better dramatic actor than he is an action actor. That's just my opinion, I like I think, the roles better. I agree know? with you. I think this is one of his best performances ever, honestly, in this movie. I think he really showed you some range and depth as an actor, a different character. Okay, yeah, him, him being from Boston is not much of a stretch, right? I get it, but Well, still. they were actually in New Orleans. No, New Orleans, you're right. My apologies, New Orleans. Um, But just the whole character, the way he showed things, and again, his own struggles internally, right? Like, yes, he knows he's the best smuggler on the planet, right? But he's no longer that guy because now he's got a family at home to worry about. And his business that he started is a home surveillance security business, which how smart is I that? thought was great juxtaposition for the character. You yeah. know, how, how smart was it? Opens up a security business. But yeah, there's some twists and turns that are really cool in it. As for Ben Foster, I think he's going to win an Oscar someday. Better, man. Um, it won't be for this one, though. I thought he was too good of an actor to be in that role. I think that role didn't do him justice. I think it should have gone to somebody with a little bit lower of a profile. Um, you know. Uh, Can I ask you something, Eric? Yeah. What would you have thought if they would have switched – and now, mind you, again, Giuseppe, I, I keep murdering this Giuseppe man's name. Berlusi. He absolutely murdered that role. He killed it. He was amazing. But don't you think, since you had Foster, if you had put him in that role as that character, even though it was a smaller role, he wasn't on screen quite as much, his performances were so much more commanding and things like that, I think Foster would have come across better as him, honestly, as Briggs, than he would have as Sebastian. Yeah, I can I can see that, um, but it, it was also weird seeing Foster play the screw up. You know, uh, he's, he's yeah, normally, he's normally a pretty in charge kind of guy. He's got his shit together, you know. So for him to be the kind of bumbling idiot brother, um, I thought he did a good job in the role. I just don't think that that role should have been for him. I think it should have been for somebody with a little bit less acting chops and i think it just wasn't the writers didn't it just wasn't the role for him because i love ben foster i think he's amazing genovese rabisi uh he's in a series on amazon prime called sneaky pete i know that which, which is a great series and he plays a con man yeah. uh genovese rabisi i think is a Amazing actor. Unfortunately, most people know him for being Phoebe's little brother on Friends. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. But if you guys haven't seen this one, absolutely yeah, amazing Bob. performance by him. Amazing performance by him. And I got to agree with you a little bit on the Foster point. I do feel like maybe it was just the role. And I get what you're saying. It's the sidekick. He's the number two on Wahlberg. Everything Wahlberg does now, he's trying to go off and do his own thing and finding out, oh, crap, I have no idea what I'm doing. It was always Wahlberg's character that did all this stuff. And 
So I, I can see what you're saying here, but if it makes sense, I was a little disappointed still because somebody with the acting chops of a Ben Foster, to me, whatever role they give you, I'm expecting to see that same performance from you, that same delivery every time. And I, I just feel like maybe you're right. Maybe he wasn't thrilled with, with the role and he just phoned it in for a paycheck. But man, that hurts. It just hurts a little bit. I get That's that. all I got, though, boys. All righty. So for my third movie, one of my all-time favorite iced movies, um, Gone in 60 Seconds. I own it, but that's not my movie. Um, <laughs> I, I don't consider that a heist movie. I consider that a chase movie. Uh, that's just my personal opinions. And wait, wait, wait. Um, he means the original Gone in 60 Seconds, by the way, not the weird remake that they did. Yeah. And um, so my movie was uh, The Score with Robert De Niro and Ed Norton, two of the best actors of their generations. Um, basically, uh, also another little known actor in there, uh, Marlon Brando. Yeah, just um, a little bit. Yeah, just... A little bit, uh, but <laughs> basically De Niro's been a professional thief, um, safe cracker, whatever you want to call him, uh, for decades. And he wants to get out. He is living in Canada and he's got a jazz restaurant slash nightclub that he wants to go straight and just do that with his girlfriend, Angela Bassett. Um, and so basically Marlon Brando's the kind of go between guy that finds the jobs, fences, the gear that he steals and everything. And he basically, uh, there's a scepter, a Royal scepter, uh, that they stumble across in, uh, in the Canadian, um, uh, what's it called? Brain fart, beauty of brain injuries, um, uh, customs. And so this thing gets caught in customs and uh, it's worth tons of money. And De Niro's like, yeah, this is going to be the last one that will get me to where I can go straight and, you know, be out of this life. This is going to be that payday because Brando has been screwing over over the years on how much, of a cut he actually gets from everything he steals. Go ahead, Joe. Got a question? No, 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 no. My hand's no. cramping up. Sorry, I shouldn't have done that off screen. <laughs> My apologies. No worries. <laughs> um, but Ed Norton, um, great role. Uh, if you've seen me on this, I've, you've heard me. Ed Norton's one of my favorites uh, ever since Primal Fear and American History X and, you know, it just goes on and on. Just an amazing actor. Um, well, he kind of shows his chops and, uh, you kind of see a little glimpse back to primal fear. And like I say, I'm not going to give anything away. Uh, I think it's a great watch. Um, but it's got, you know, some twists and turns. It's, it's got the whole planning of the heist, the, the actual heist, uh, post heist, you know, just all around a great movie. And, you know, when you get De Niro in a serious role and Norton in a serious role together, man, you know, and then you throw Brando and Angela Bassett in there, man. Came just around, the just a second. Yeah. I, I forgot what year it came out. Uh, just one second. Yeah. The beauty of traumatic brain injuries, memory shit. Um, 2001 is when it came out. And another reason that De Niro was really against pulling this heist is it's actually taking place. Normally he does all his um, thievery in the United States and then comes back to Canada. And he was always like, you never pull a job where you live. And Brando basically comes up with it's worth so much money. He's got to do it. Have either of you guys seen it? Unmute. I have not. 
<laughs> I was about to say, I saw Joe's lips moving, but I don't hear anything. <laughs> I was crunching it. I didn't want to be rude. All right. Um, I have. It's been a while since I've seen it, actually, but I have seen it. One of the movies that I uh, sat down and watched with my dad. Um, I thought both of the individuals who you were speaking of as our two of our classics with De Niro and, and Norton really delivered very, very powerful performances in this one, very good performances. I think you could make the argument that Nor that Edward Norton stole the show, but uh, I, again, it would be a toss-up a lot of the time, but Norton really did deliver an amazing performance in this one. And this is one of those films where when you talk about like the actors involved, none of them phoned it home, man. They all went in. They could almost see them like they looked at each other like, okay, everyone knows we're on this thing. If any one of us sucks, they're going to look at us and go, well, you're the reason the movie sucks now because there's good actors everywhere. You phoned it in. So great job here, man. Really very well done movie. And um, I had a feeling this would be on Eric's list, honestly. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like, I'm just saying, you got a bit of a man crush on Edward Norton. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, he he's no Brad Pitt, but yeah. <laughs> but if I had to go to jail and be in a cell with somebody, <laughs> nice. All right, so Joe. Okay. Um. Speaking of that, um, of um. Ben Foster, uh, and, and Ben Foster, uh, playing a brother. Uh -huh. Um, my final one. And I, and I have this as last because when I first saw this film, I was a little disappointed. And then I said, okay, I need to watch it again. And this live stream gave me the perfect chance to watch it a second time. And then I watched it a third time as a result. Um, I'm going with 2016's hell or high water. Uh, it's got um, Foster and Jeff Bridges, who I adore. I haven't seen Chris Pine in much, uh, and much outside of the um, Star Trek, um, but I like him in this film. But here's here's some quick trivia, though, real quickly. Um, I have not watched this show, but it got a lot of buzz. How many of you have heard of the show Yellowstone? Have you heard of that, show, Kevin Costner? I've heard of it. I haven't. I, I know I should be watching it. I just haven't actually friggin' turned it on yet. Um, how about the movie Sicario? No. And the sequel. Ooh, you have not seen Sicario, Joe. Nope. Ooh. One of Benicio's best roles, in my opinion. Benicio del Toro. Um, See, that's, that's, that's a bit of a problem for me. I'm not a big Benicio fan. Oh, okay. Oh, Chris says, um, uh, Bat and Casey, um, and then how many of you have seen uh, Wind River with Jeremy Renner in the yes. Star Wars? Yes, yes, I have. I was about to say, why does that sound familiar? The one where he's uh, he's like a, a marshal or a cop or something. Yeah. In, in Is that Alaska, I think it is? Uh, it's like Montana. It's up in Montana. So it's yeah. snow covered. Everything, yeah. Yes, I have, right. yes. So the And then Hell or High Water. The common thread here is the screenwriter, Taylor Sheridan. Okay who has written all of these films, and he directed uh, Wind River. But the coolest thing about all of this, to me, is how many Sons of Anarchy fans do we have out there? Right? Because Taylor Sheridan... Is there such a thing? ...in Sons of Anarchy, because he's an actor as well, and maybe you all remember this dude. All right? Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have. Well, his, he was I the have cop him. I hated till I loved him. David, <laughs> David Hale, David Hale. But Taylor Sheridan wrote um, Yellowstone. He's written Yellowstone for I think all three seasons or whatever. He wrote Sicario. He wrote and directed Wind River, and he's the writer of To Hell or High um, of Hell or High Water. So uh, to me, this is a screenwriter writer I need to follow because I haven't seen Yellowstone, but I've heard rave reviews of it, and I love the other movies. Right. Um, yeah, Casey, I agree. It is a bit dark, but it, it's very, very cool. Um, so now the director for this film was a New Zealander, which is kind of interesting because um, the way the film was shot and what they wanted to show had a unique perspective because you have a New Zealander trying to shoot a neo-Western thinking about, you know, looking at the the, the landscape and stuff with, with different eyes, right? His name is David McKenzie, by the way. 
Uh, he's the director of this film. Um, I'm going to spoil, just so you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so anyone in here who hasn't seen it, I'm going to spoil. Um, basic plot summary is uh, Chris Pine and Ben Foster are brothers. Ben Foster is in prison. Their mother gets sick and dies just before Ben Foster is released. Uh, Chris Pine takes care of the mother. Chris Pine is the silent stoic type, and Ben Foster is 18,000 ways of messed up. He's loud. He's angry. He's, he's, he might be a little bipolar. I mean, he is out there. As much as Joe said, that other role that Joe mentioned, he thought Foster phoned it in. Foster is definitely dialed in and playing this guy to the hill. And this is one of those roles that made me so angry when I saw Contraband, like looking back at it, right? This is one of those roles where I'm like, look at what he did here. Why didn't you do that here? But maybe it's the character. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's that. And Casey just asked a good question. Uh, I don't know why I'm texting it because I could type it. Casey, if it is, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember that coming up as being part of, but it's very possible. It's a very realistic story to where I could sit there and say, oh, I could see this actually happening to people. Um, so he, here's the upshot. Here's where it becomes a heist film. There is a, a, a secondary mortgage that has been taken out on the mom's ranch. All right. Their mother's ranch. And they don't have the money to pay it off. And it's about to come due. Well, in that time, Chris Pine's character, uh, Toby, has found out, as has the bank that owns the mortgage, that there is oil on that land and lots of it. So they don't have the money to pay off that mortgage. Ben Foster is out of prison now. So they are going to go, and they're very smart about this, they are going to go and do multiple small bank robberies till they get enough money to pay off that debt. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Pine Toby's uh, has a failed marriage and sons, and he wants to leave that ranch to his kids so that they can have something he never had. And it's an interesting discussion about the cycle of poverty and how the cycle of poverty is just as much a real thing as the cycle of richness. You know, if you're rich and you you give your money to your kids and they start off rich, right? If you're poor, same kind of thing. So that's an interesting uh, sort of thing based on the writer's uncle being a... Oh, okay, Eric. Good, good. Hey, Mel's Beer Collection. What's up? I was going to say, I did just look it up. Um, it is, it is ba loosely based on a real story. Yes. It's based around a Texas sheriff named McNamara. Okay. So, uh, Bridges actually had conversations with him to get in the character. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna get to Jeff Bridges now. So we have Ben Foster and Chris Pine are blood brothers. Then you have these two guys, the Texas Rangers, um, Jeff Bridges, and I cannot remember the name of the other guy, but he's of native extraction. He's native Hispanic in the film. I don't know if he's native Hispanic uh, totally, but he's native Hispanic in the film. Um, and they are brothers by occupation, okay? They're partners. They're Texas Rangers. Uh, Jeff Bridges' character is also always saying racist stuff to the guy about his Indian roots, his native roots, right? And one of my favorite lines of, that he says is the, 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 his partner, Jeff Bridges' partner says, when are you going to give it up on the native stuff? When are you going to do the Hispanic jokes? He's like, oh, I'm saving those. We're, we're going to get to those. Those are coming uh -huh. down the road, right? So he's really wrong and really racist, but in the sense of when you're with someone who you really know, is it then racist or is it okay? I mean, he's getting under the guy's skin, but they know each other. They're brothers. They would, they would, um, they would give their lives for each other, and they get into dangerous situations due to their line of work. Go ahead, Eric. I would say it was more of a bust and ball situation. Yes, so would I. I and great, great back and forth during those different scenes. Now, one of the great, one of the great, not twists, but one of the great ironies is they are stealing money from the banks that hold the mortgage. And they're going about it very smart. They're only stealing out of like the cash tills. They're only stealing fives, tens, and twenties. They're not stealing the big money. So it can't be traced or can't be ink splattered. Or, so they're going out. So they're not getting like one mega haul of tens of thousands of dollars. They're getting a few thousand here and a few thousand there. So they are success. They are successful in many of these jobs. The Rangers come on the scene, um, 
And as a result, there are only so many of these banks out there. It does, it's not a huge chain. There may be like six or seven of them. And Jeff Bridges' character realizes that eventually they have to come to this one. And so they stake it out, the Jeff Bridges and his partner. Um, we get to a climax, a culmination where they go in and they do a bank job and the bank is a lot larger than they expected because they've been in these hole in the wall towns in Texas, you know, literally one and two people. Well, they go into this one, which is in a slightly larger town, but there are a couple dozen people in the bank and it's payday. As a result, Ben Foster's character kills somebody and someone who was going to shoot Ben Foster gets killed by Toby who is not violent and not a dickhead. I mean, Ben Foster is off the walls. He is violent. He is aggressive. He is crass. Um, he has sex next to his brother with this girl he picks up at a casino. Um, he's just this kind of guy. So they get the money. The Rangers are hot on their tail. But it's Texas, right? This is this was my favorite scene because as they're getting ready to leave, and remember, they've only hit these banks that have a couple people there's guys that have concealed carry permits and they are not going to let the bank robbers go. So as the bank robbers are trying to escape, you get five, six guys in their trucks chasing the bank robbers down because they've all got pistols. All right. So they were, they had taken two cars in. They left one car on the outskirts of town. They got to that car. And in the back of that car was a semi-automatic uh, rifle very easily, Ben Foster brings out the semi-automatic rifle and starts spraying the guys as all the guys are coming in towards them. <clears throat> no, I agree with you, Casey. I agree. I'm just saying that some people could read it that way in, in, in these modern times. Um, and so then all those guys – went and, and Foster is cool as can be. He literally just takes out the, the gun, brrr, flips the magazine around, brrr, and gets rid of all of the civilian posse. And then eventually uh, the Rangers start to make up ground. And one of the main themes is to me is how, how do you define love? Okay. Um, not romantic love, but fraternal love. And right. Ben Foster says to Toby, you take your car, you take the stuff you'll get out of here. And just to cut through it all, Ben Foster is going to sacrifice himself so that Toby and Toby's kids are taken care of because Ben Foster knows chances are because of the kind of dick he is, he's just going to wind up in prison anyway. And now with this bank robbery, having gone bad and people having been murdered, he knows that that's where he's going. So he's going to go out on his terms. It's that kind of vibe. He drives his four wheeler up into some mountains or low, low lying Hills. He also has a sniper rifle and he seems to be pretty decent with it. And he goes up there and has a final confrontation with the cops. Um, I'm not going to go beyond that because I do want to leave some stuff for you. But I will say that if you're hoping Ben Foster gets out of that going up against various Texas police forces, you are sadly mistaken. And indeed, it is Jeff Bridges' character that kills uh, Ben Foster. And the way it's shot is gorgeous. I just want to talk about this. The, the way the frames move, you know, we get him up there, Ben Foster, he's sniping. Jeff Bridges pulls a local, says, you know, these hills and, and flanks him and gets behind him. Thanks to the help of the local guy. And Jeff Bridges comes in behind and has a rifle that belonged to the local guy. And you see Jeff, um, uh, Ben Foster just sitting there and he's just kind of enjoying himself. He's killed a couple cops. He's got them all kind of flustered. His brother has escaped. And he's sitting there and then you get a shot of him and you see Jeff Bridges, who's way away, aiming down on him. And you see it for a quick second. And then the camera shifts to Jeff Bridges' scope and you see the shot that takes out Ben Foster. It's really, really well done and well shot and and very effective. Um, ben Foster kicks ass in this movie. Chris Pine, I got a lot of respect for because I like him as Kirk. I'm a Star Trek guy to a degree. But his acting was so subtle and nuanced. He was believable. But he also would risk a lot for his brother. He killed in a bank for his brother. Two guys were trying to rouse them outside of a, or trying to rouse Ben Foster outside of a, a like a quickie mart when Chris Pine was inside of it. And he came out and beat the shit out of a guy because he was giving his brother 
So it really is what are the depths of love that we see, you know, handed out with these two brotherly characters. And upon the second view, I really enjoy this movie a heck of a lot more than I did initially. And if you haven't seen it, even though I've spoiled some of it, I highly recommend it. Guys, I know you've seen it. What do you got to say? The ending to me with Foster was the simple bad guy. Um, old cliche, right? Right. And it's that you live that lifestyle. You live that way. You're only going to end one of two ways, right? You're going to die by the bullet or you're going to die in jail. Which one's it going to be? And I think in that moment, Foster looked at his brother and said, one of us is going this way anyways. You have a chance. You can go live a normal life. You can get out of this. Let me do this. Get the hell out of here. And again, all the guys you have mentioned had amazing performances, but Foster's in this movie, man. Holy crap. How that man doesn't have more awards to hang off the, on the mantle at this point, I don't know. So many times that he's been on a screen, he absolutely steals the show. And he's amongst other great actors half the time. But he just delivers such amazing performances. And that's what he did in this one, man. I absolutely love this movie. I love it even more because of Foster's performance in it. And now that I actually just checked and there's some backstory to it and some real life stuff tied into it, now I'm going to have to go watch it again and do some research and such. But yeah. I, 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 there is there's still some cool stuff to come after Ben Foster's death. Like Ben Foster dies, you look, and there's still 20 minutes left in this film mm -hmm. to go. So there is some stuff coming after that death, and I did not want to spoil that. I wanted you to all to see how that played out. Eric? Um, love this movie. Uh, when this movie came out, I, it's when I was doing uh, backstage security at concerts and sporting events and things like that. So uh, my schedule was very sporadic, and I used to go see a lot of matinees. And when this came out, Chris Pine, I was like, eh, he's okay as Kirk, you know. Yeah. But Foster, um, one of my favorite roles of his is in the remake of The Mechanic with him and Jason Statham, which I know you're not big on, uh, Barbado, but yeah. <laughs> that, that was just a great role. And I've thought he's been a talented actor uh, ever since I first started seeing him and stuff, you know, when he was on Freaks and Geeks. You know, Ben Foster was great in that movie or TV show, you know, and so I've liked him since then. Freaks and Geeks, if you haven't seen it, he was on that, yeah. He, Franco was on that too, right? Eric James Franco, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ben Foster played the brother with Downs of hey. the girl, yeah. Or he, he, he's a kid that they're mainstreaming in school or whatever, but he, he plays a kid with developmental disabilities. Interesting. Um, and, you know, kind of parallel him with other actors of similar generation. You know, you had uh, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, and what's, Gilbert Gra what's eating Gilbert Grape, you know, and then he did such a good job in that role. That was like, you really see, wow, this kid can act. And Ben Foster was kind of the same way. So I've been following his career and, you know, Alpha Dog, you know, he's great at playing the badass, you know, that's, but he's just got his acting chops. Like I said earlier, he's going to win an Oscar someday. Yeah. And if he doesn't, it's going to be a damn shame or it's just because the right people didn't put him in the right role. Right. He, he's um, always that second in, sorry, Joe, he's always no, no, second in command. He even gets second billing to Chris Pine, but he um, he gets the, the majority of the action and stuff. I still don't know that Hollywood looks at him as a, as a leading dude yet, a guy that can carry it. Supporting him. actors get awards too, man. That's Let's true. go. That's true. You're right. My bad. Yep. We got to get Ben some awards, man. I don't know. If maybe he does have some, but if he does, he doesn't have nearly enough. That much is the way I feel, at least. Yeah. Uh, one quick thing about this. I'm sitting here doing some reading while we're talking, and the marshal, okay, so Bridges' character, right? Yes, right? I'm not wrong right. on that one, right? He's, yeah, yeah Jeff he's a ranger, but... In yeah. The All right, his character is based on a true-life character. And the story for Hell or High Water is a blend of, from what I can tell, stories that this, that this McNamara, the sheriff, shared 
uh, with his cousin who actually wrote the screenplay. Oh, so, so Sharon is his cousin. No, oh, I thought yes, was yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. No, he's his cousin. He's his cousin. He called him and told him I was making a, I'm writing a movie, stuff like that. And you're the inspiration for the the lead. I mean, I guess bad guy in this case, even though he's a good guy. Yeah. I mean, whatever. <laughs> you know. So he didn't even know about it until he was told, and he actually met Jeff Bridges face to face and helped him work through the character, and he picked up all his mannerisms and everything else from meeting him. So pretty cool. Yeah, his, it's interesting because I think Jeff Bridges is a great actor, but his voice sounds a lot like um, Rooster Cogburn's voice in True Grit, in the 2010 True Grit. There's a lot of similarity there. And that was my only faulting of Bridges because I'm like, I, when you because when, True Grit came first. When you hear him in True Grit, I'm like, oh, what a great voice for this character. Yeah. And it's kind of just a little riff off of that voice for this film, you know? Well, well, maybe he just figured to Sheriff badass kind of types, you know, like or South. Cause that was Arkansas and true grit. Um, let me just give the numbers real quick. <laughs> and I'll hand it over to you to, to talk about a film I've never seen. Um, um, I got a few things about hell or high water as well. Oh, good. Good air. Okay. Um, it, it cost 12 million to make and it made 37.8 at uh, international. So that's not bad. Three times on return. That's considered a success. Maybe not a blockbuster, but a financial success. Go ahead, Eric. Um, one of my favorite lines in the movie is uh, one of the first robberies they do in a bank. There's this old guy. And when I say old guy, I'm not talking about Joe and my age. I'm talking old guy, you know, eighties, late seventies. And uh, I don't remember if Ben Foster or Chris Pine says it, but he's like, uh, do you have a gun? And the old guy's like, is Texas son. Everybody's got a gun. Yeah, yeah. He pulls out, you know, a 44 mag. Yeah. Or whatever it was. But uh, a few things that I, the dialogue I thought was amazing. Um, the Jeff Bridges voice, uh, not Bridges' best role, in my opinion. He's always going to be the dude. Yeah. But, um, Kind of similar to the voice he did in what was it, Crazy Heart, where he was the like the one hit wonder, right? Uh, Country music player, yeah. Um, so I don't know if that was just kind of his go to southern Texas guy accent. Um, but that didn't bother me. I thought I didn't think it was a negative impact on the role. Um, I thought the relationship that he had with his partner. I liked how he busted balls and like, like uh, Bobby Casey said earlier, you know, trying to kind of toughen him up a little bit, you know, make him a little more seasoned yeah. of an officer, you know? So I, I definitely see that. Um, oh, catch me if you can. I just watched that the other day, Bobby, one of my all time faves. Um, but yeah, Ben Foster and Chris Pine, Chris Pine, surprised me yeah um you know i'd only seen him being kirk and you know this was no action well there was some action but it wasn't an action movie you know and yeah chris pine surprised me and you know ben foster like i say i'll i'll pay to see any movie he's in yeah um a couple more quick things that you reminded me of number one it's it reminds me very much of like a No Country for Old Men in that it's a neo-Western that uses the trappings of the Western, but isn't necessarily a Western. It's kind of straddling this weird, you know, you get the big wide open vistas, the cowboy hats and everything. The line Eric talked about with the old man where he says, everyone carries a gun in Texas is kind of like foreshadowing that final bank robbery. <laughs> where all those dudes do have guns. And yeah. it's just a little behind the scenes stuff. There's this great moment in when they were filming where, the sun is almost down, and based on where the camera setup was, the two actors would have been in silhouette, and 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 Mackenzie really wanted this. So they just improv and if you guys remember, it was right before they went to do the big bank heist. They're in silhouette, just goofing around, kind of wrestling and slap fighting with each other. Um, that scene wasn't in the script or anything like that. It was Mackenzie just wanting to capture the light and also capture their relationship. It was like they were boys again back on that ranch, goofing around, showing their love as, you know, males will always do. It's kind of going to be something physical or something like that. But it was this nice little moment before everything goes to fucking hell. Right. 
Yeah. That's the reason they call it magic hour. Right. Magic hour indeed. All right. Cool. Joe's coming up with one that is way out of left field. No one will have anything yeah. to say about this bad boy. No, nobody's ever seen this film. I promise you. <laughs> Definitely not anybody on this panel. Okay. Mm -mm. It is so not a talked about movie amongst us three. I don't even know why I would think of bringing it up. You know? <laughs> But uh, we're going all the way back to 1992 here, boys, and we're going to one of my favorites with, with QT and Reservoir Dogs. Yes, the heist movie that never, ever shows the heist. In... <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's why we were all there, right? It was some kind of heist going on. And this is the movie. This is it. This is the one that started my love affair with Quentin Tarantino. This is where everything kind of spanned from, right? Like, so you have a movie here with, and you know what's funny, Joe, was you were talking about the killing before, right? I said, man, you can almost dime for dime it with Reservoir Dogs, except it doesn't have the, the happy ending, apparently. Like, that seemed to be the big difference there, really, right? They didn't all get what they wanted out of Reservoir Dogs at the end here. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that caught me off too, Joe, is you ready for this? The budget for Reservoir Dogs is one point two million. It made two point nine in the movie theaters. That's it. This wasn't, you know, some big money making hit or something. Right. But this is the film that is credited for being the one that really showed people what Tarantino had. This is, this is it. This is Reservoir Dogs. This is his first venture out into the world. On his own. Well, no, wait, I'm wrong there, ain't I, Joe? It's his first directorial debut. His Thank debut you. He, he had done a screenplay or two before this. Right, so, okay. So this is, his, this is his first directorial debut. And in this movie, we get to see some of the, well, obviously this is their first venture with him, really, but some of the Tarantino standards here, right? So Who's in the movie? You got Harvey Keitel. Wow, he's never been on a film with Tarantino before, has he, Joe? Um, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, Chris Penn, uh, Steve Buscemi, Lawrence Tierney, Edward Bunker, and then, of course, Tarantino himself. And basically, um, Lawrence Tierney plays Joe. That's, I think that's the only thing we're ever told about him is his name is Joe, right? Right. He plays Joe. He is organizing a big, a big heist, basically, a big diamond job. And he's pulling together guys that he's had from different jobs and going to put together a team he thinks can get this done. Now, it sounds like they've done this in the past because he uses the colors and things like that and to give guys their names. And one of the great lines in this is where he's sitting there handing out the colors to everybody. And he's like, you know, you're Mr. Mr. White, you're Mr. Orange, you're Mr. Blonde, Mr. Brown. And then he looks at Buscemi's character and says, and you're Mr. Pink. And he goes, Joe, uh, uh, why do I got to be Mr. Pink? Can I be something else? Can I be Mr. This, Mr. That? He goes, no, you're Mr. Pink. Well, why can't I be Mr. So-and-so? Because that one's on a different job. You're Mr. Pink. And, you know, he says, well, it could be worse. You could be Mr. Brown. Sounds like Mr. Shit. Like, it just... To see grown men actually arguing over which color they were handed was pretty funny, you know? <laughs> um, so he puts them together to kind of put together this team to get this job done. And there's so many great performances in this film. Honestly, so many amazing performances. Uh, uh, Kaitel puts on a great one. Tim Roth steals the absolute show the few times he's on the screen where he actually has command of the screen i should say um but like michael madsen too man mr blonde might be my favorite character ever written and i don't know what that says about me as a human being but you know that that's who it is really that's who i love i love mr blonde and you've got so many different aspects to this uh so i'm going to give a few spoilers here right um tim roth who is mr orange is actually an undercover cop working on this gig He's been sent in to signal the cops when it's time to come in. This is his job. He's been undercover with these guys from the very beginning. He's been earning their trust. And he's actually grown to build a bond with Harvey Keitel's character, Mr. White. 
they actually seem to be becoming very good friends. So they got that little inner thing going on there. You got Mr. Blonde coming out of prison. He knows Joe and he knows Chris Penn's character, Nice Guy Eddie. So they feel like they owe him. He went to jail for them. That's how Blonde winds up on this job because they feel like, well, we owe Blondie and he's our rabbit's foot. He always takes care of us. Put him on the job. So they, they get this whole crew together. They go do the heist. We never see the heist. Ever. All we know is that they're going to, to do the heist. And, and then something went horribly wrong because you got Buscemi's character and Kaitel's character meeting up at a place and they're talking about who's dead, who's not dead, who's been shot. Mr. Orange is laying there bleeding on the floor. They think there's a rat. They know it can't be Orange, right, because he's been shot. Just, again, the Quentin Tarantino beginnings here, the standards, everything, just so well done. I mean, me and Joe did a whole damn series about this movie because we loved it so much. Did I lose you guys by any chance? No, I'm right here. No. Okay, just making sure because the screen is actually froze on me. Uh, so I can't <laughs> actually tell if I'm here or not. Um, one little other funny thing that me and Joe actually talked about, and that's Mr. Uh, was it Mr. Blue? Was it Joe? Yeah, uh, Eddie Bunker. Yeah, was that the one that Tarantino hated to work with, or was it Lawrence Tierney? Oh, it was Tierney. Tierney, he had gotten to the fist fight on stage, on set. Yes. It was Lawrence Tierney, Joe, that Tarantino actually hated so much that they actually got into a fight on set. But the biggest thing to me I took from Reservoir Dogs forever is, number one, Tarantino doesn't bake, doesn't bank on the big thrills and chills moments. He's not an over-the-top action scene guy. Though later on down the road, he did start doing some of those things with the Kill Bills and stuff oh, like yeah. that. Tarantino bakes more on the, the dialogue. The, you know, script play, the characters, building an actual story, which is exactly what Reservoir Dogs is, because I, I don't know, Joe, what would you say? About 60 percent of the movie is filmed in a 12 by 12 empty warehouse. Yeah, it's actually an old mortuary, an old uh, right. undertaker funeral, it's, funeral home. That's what I was trying to say. And most of the movie is filmed there between with two characters doing most of the talking. Yeah. You know, so. He builds it, he built it on the dialogue. He builds it on the actual storyline. And he never gives you a whole lot of answers throughout this film. I mean, even his own character, right? Mr. Brown. He's in the movie for all of what, eight minutes, Joe, would you say total? Yeah, at most. <laughs> he he gives himself eight minutes in total. Mr. Blue, we never even find out what happens to Blue. We're we're assuming he's dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they, they don't know that for sure. I think, I think they do mention he died, but I could be wrong, Joe. Do they? I, I think. You know what? I'm remembering a scene where Blondie says something about Blue's dead. Yeah. Be because Orange and White are not... Orange, White, and Pink had no idea. So it had to be Blonde that was the one that told them. Yeah, because uh, Bushimi and Madsen were going back and forth on why Madsen had shot people and started the shooting. Right. And so that's when Bashimi and Madsen were getting really pissed off at each other. No, that was Kaitel actually. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's that was Kaitel. Yeah. Kaitel and Madsen almost come to blows. Yeah. You find out that, you know, during the bank job, essentially they hit the alarm, which pissed off Michael Madsen's character. And to quote Kaitel, he just said, this is what he did. Pop. Bang, 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 which Madsen found pretty funny, by the way. Blonde thought it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> and just great performances all the way around. Ryan Tomatoes gives this movie a 92. I think they shortchanged it. It should get the 400, in my opinion. I love this film. I don't see a whole lot of weaknesses in the movie at all. Yeah. Would it have been nice to have seen a few more of the action scenes that happened? Sure. But I didn't need them. Great, great job. And it really set the table for Tarantino and the road to come. Here comes the dumbest question. Hey, have you guys seen the movie? <laughs> Is there anyone? Well, 
maybe someone, I think we got like five still in the chat. Maybe someone out there has it. I don't know. Maybe. How does that happen? You know, you want to go, go, or you want me to go? You go ahead, Eric, because he and I did a whole series, like you said. Yeah. Huh? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I discovered this when I was living in Vegas, right before I moved back, right before I moved to Colorado, and um, the dialogue was just gold. You know, the back and forth between the characters just blew me away, and I loved, 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 loved true romance. <laughs> so when um, I wasn't even able to see it in the theaters because it didn't do that great, but a oh my buddy God. Mine turned me on to the VHS of it and man fell in love with Tarantino and uh, so many things that I love about this movie. Talk about it. Home run for a directorial writing debut. Yeah. And I don't know. It's one of the best, uh, but the opening scene and they're talking about tipping the waitress. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> chef is in my name. I was in the restaurant industry for over 30 years. Pay freaking attention to that scene. <laughs> okay. So, and what they didn't go over is when you pay with a credit card, the way they get taxed is on a percentage of their credit card sales, not their overall sales what's trackable by the credit card. So if you pay with a credit card and you leave less than a 15% tip, you're taking money out of their pocket literally because they're getting taxed on 15% of their credit card sales. So off my soapbox. Well, um, wait, wait, Eric, before you get out that bat, and, and I didn't realize this, some states like Pennsylvania, it's legal for service people in, in the restaurant industry to work under minimum wage. Oh yeah. Which oh, yeah. blew my mind. Like what you're not even going to pay a minimum wage? You know. No. A lot of They don't work for they don't work for minimum wage in Jersey, I don't think. Uh, most oh, okay. of the places I've worked, they don't make minimum wage. They have a separate minimum wage, uh -huh. which um like in the early 90s was $2.13. Yeah. yeah. So almost always servers, bartenders, busboys got checks because you had to cut a check to the employee for zero point zero zero dollars. Uh. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry. We can't gloss over the fact that camel cam just said he hasn't seen reservoir dogs. <laughs> we're going to let, let Eric finish. Cause then we're going to throw cam to the wolves. Oh my um, God. But uh, yeah, the scene with Michael Madsen, Stuck in the middle with you. Yeah, and that leads me to my my next point that I was going to say. Uh, the thing that I loved about the first few movies, now granted, in Glorious Bastards, you didn't get it too much, but the soundtracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, he always has great scores in his movie, but the soundtracks, I'm pretty sure. I heard one time that he's the one that chooses the yeah. songs for the yeah. scenes. Yeah. And the thing that most people don't realize is the D radio DJ for the station that they play throughout the yes. whole movie is Stephen Wright. Gotta be an old one of the most true. clever comedians, one of the best one line comedians. Great. My favorite joke of his, I just got a full body tattoo of myself. <laughs> I tell you what, Stephen Wright is the shit, but some people just don't get him. But I love that dude. Yeah. Yeah. I just got a map of the United States actual size scale says one mile equals one mile. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, his soundtracks, uh, you know, for Pulp Fiction, for the Kill Bills, for uh, Death Proof just phenomenal and then you know when he does the period pieces you can't really have you know a tune from the early 70s in Django I mean well but he does because we were doing Hateful Eight mm -hmm. and you get this song that'll pop up that'll pertain yeah even though Hateful Eight has a Maricone score he'll still sneak them in there they're just not as prevalent or as or yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah yeah we were doing Hateful Eight unfortunately that's YouTube yeah. <laughs> exactly um, the only thing I will say is 
you know, being a, a teacher of film in high school, when I revisited Tarantino and when I did the series with Joe, there's some great things that are that are lying that are hot lying in plain sight. That the whole reason I teach film is to teach my students how to look at these things, right? When yeah, pink and white are discussing things, orange is bleeding out, blonde hasn't gotten to the mortuary yet. When they're discussing things, there's stuff in the room they're in that has virtually all the colors of of the cast of, of the guys. Yeah. Um, when they talk about when they talk about a um, uh, the heist and stuff, a car pulls away and in its wake is an orange balloon. I mean, there's just all these even in his first film, all these little subtle things he's doing, all the ways that filmmakers can convey meaning and convey story to you without having dialogue do the trick for them that I saw in the film that I really, really appreciate. I, I appreciated much more on a, on a technical or, or film filmic kind of level um, from Quentin. And I, I kind of want to go through all of his stuff, save Jackie Brown to do that same thing and, and look at all of that again with it. Oh well, yeah. And I love how he gives little homages with camera angles and things like that to Kubrick and to, you know, the Kung Fu theater and, you know, uh, yeah, Arasawa, you know. Listen, one of this, and me and Joe actually talked about this scene, and I don't know why I love it so much, or why it uh, captivates me so much, if you will, but it's the scene where Orange is getting ready to leave to go meet up with the rest of the crew. Yeah. Like, they're downstairs, they're getting ready to go for the job, and he stops as he's about to go, and he goes over to his change dish real quick, and he pushes the change around and stuff, and takes out a wedding ring. And puts his wedding ring on. And like me and Joe said, in that moment, you don't know. Is that him going, oh, man, this is about to get real. If I'm going, I want to have my ring on. Or is that this is part of my character I almost left without my ring? Yeah. You know? So, like, even just putting something like that in the movie without explaining why it's there makes you think in that moment what's going on. Right. And it's things like that that have always made me love Tarantino. Um, wasn't his first movie like a birthday something or another? Um, well, if you're talking about a short or something like that, I'd have to dig deep, Casey. This is his first feature that he wrote and directed. He's never directed mm -hmm. anything he hasn't written, um, or at least co-written. He might have done some stuff with the Rodriguez that was co-written. And um, and True Romance had the screenplay out and was was out, I believe, before Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. And he also did some screen or some um, some uh, yeah. like doctoring. You know, where he doesn't. wasn't there a, a film that he was writing or, or maybe screenwriting that he walked off of that Not I on killers with. Yes. Kill, yes. Yeah, killers. Killers is the one that he didn't even want his name attached to it by the time Oliver Stone got it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like he really didn't like what Stone did with that film. But once Pulp Fiction won its Oscars, he quit doing screenplays that other people directed. He only wrote mm -hmm. for himself. You know, because he, he did a bunch of those early and then Pulp Fiction won the two two Oscars, I think it won. And that was and that was that. All right. Now, can we get the camo cam? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what the hell, Cam? <laughs> How in the world have you not seen Reservoir Dogs? How does that happen? Wait a minute. Time out. Have you not seen any Tarantino films? Because if you haven't seen a Tarantino film, then maybe I'll accept the fact right. that you haven't seen Reservoir Dogs. But if you have seen other Tarantino films and know what he's capable of, then how have you not gone back and watched what's arguably his best film? Hey, I've never seen Animal House, and lots of people look at me like I have three heads because I've never seen it. It's just not the kind of film that appeals to me. And now it's been so long. I mean, it's you know fifty years since the thing debuted. Almost, you know, I'm I'm not going to go back and watch it. So I'll just have to have that missing from my life. Yeah, but that, that see, no, see to me, like Animal House is Animal House, right? It's, it's a funny movie, it's good, but I don't know, maybe because I'm such a big Tarantino head, that's why it gets to me. You know, like one day, hopefully in my life, I will own every single Tarantino film ever ever made, even though I don't even watch friggin' Blu rays anymore. I just want to have them all. <laughs> you know, um, one day I'll own like the pop characters for all the ones they make for his movies, all that stuff. But to me, once you watch one Tarantino film, if you like them, then you're hooked. Yeah. You, and you want to go see the rest of them. So I'm like, how in the world has somebody not seen Reservoir Dog? It just doesn't register with me. 
I just watched Porky's for the first time. Yeah, Porky's. Ha, ah, that's funny. Demo and Animal House is awesome. Yeah, Chris, I know. And there might have been a time or place where I would have seen it, but now I'm just too old. And now I'm looking for films that really interest me. And Animal House isn't that, you know. I, I just know it isn't going to be that. I was never the biggest Belushi fan anyway. I thought he was okay, but I never got wrapped up in him being like super, super funny. I just thought he was an okay comedian. But um, Porky's was awesome, <laughs> particularly if you're a teenager when it comes out. You said you haven't seen it, but I'm a comedy geek. I, I, well, you know, it's just, you know, uh, okay, it, it's more slapstick physical stuff, and that's not – I prefer Monty Python-esque comedy more than, you know, physical slapstick kind of humor. But anyway, I think that wraps us – now starting to question my topic choice. <laughs> well, well, at least you're not working with Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, gentlemen. Don't, don't question your topic choice the more – I don't know that any of us would have hit on that. You know, maybe Eric would have. I never would have. Maybe Eric and Joe would have. Um, but the idea is that you choose. So go with yeah. it. Go with it. Have fun with it. You know, it's going to be you and Eric. Eric's dialed in. He wants to do that kind of stuff. You know, we're three film dudes that love film. You can hit us yep. with anything, and we're gonna we're gonna say, yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah. So yeah, you run. You still run with your college humor, um, high school humor, however you you want to call that. Yeah. Um, when Joe first brought up that concept, you know, it's like, okay, well, these are some of the topics and uh, uh, Joe 973 and I are both like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Sports, sure. You know, uh, team, yeah, we got it. I mean, you're not going to hit us with too many genres out there where we don't at least have a couple favorites. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, every every single film buff or whatever you want to call us on the planet right we all have our specific genre that we love right like that's the one that we always go back to if we're bored or whatever that's something that and for me it's always been horror i love my horror movies so if there, even if there's a bad horror movie on i'll watch it half the time um but eric's right you're never gonna find a genre really where we're like oh yeah i don't watch that no we watch it all and we've always got at least two or three that we're like those were really good. Those are our favorites. Gentlemen, I have an idea real quick, though. Um, yeah. And I know we usually discuss the soft screen, but what the hell, we're on screen anyway, so let's talk about it. Okay. Here's my thought. Um, and maybe this can be our next buffer video, if you shall, or whatever it might be. What if we do a night where we're always picking our own top threes, right? Uh-oh. I know where this well, is going. <laughs> what if we do a night where... Joe, Joe, Eric, each pick an actor, a random actor, let's say, right? Or just somebody they like a lot, whatever it might be. And we have to pass them off to each other, and they have to go find three favorites I'm from down. that actor. I'm down I with call that. Adam Sandler. <laughs> I'm down with I that. Mean, totally. Well, then, if you're getting Adam Sandler, I'm going to take him from you, and then that's I'm good to go now. <laughs> Yeah, Joe, I, I'd be totally fine. We can refine that in the DMs, but I would be totally yeah. fine with that. Yeah. yeah, it just came to me now, though. I don't know why, but I thought that was a good idea. Yeah, there's so many amazing actors that have been in multiple great movies. I mean, you know, like Jeff Bridges has been in so many amazing roles, and, you know, Kurt Russell, you know, I mean, yeah. I love well, I just, I think it could be a cool concept as well if maybe – like, all right, so we talked about Foster a ton tonight, so obviously whatever, but maybe there's an actor out there that we know, we love, and we think is amazing, but the mainstream, or maybe we think the guys out there don't know about him as well, and you could pull him into the loop and try and get the other guy to watch and talk about him a little bit. I just thought it was a cool concept. Yeah. I don't want to drag things out, though. I know we're getting a little long in the tooth here. Um, no, I think that that's a, a great idea. Uh, what I just wanted to say is for the people, how many are still in here? We got, I think five, cause I'm, I'm one of them. Um, we're doing directors next week and mm -hmm. one of the, one of two the weeks, week, sorry, two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Yeah. I just wanted it to be weekly, I guess. Um, one of the missions, at least for me, and I think for the other guys to some degree as well is, um, you know where you can get all the stuff that is is commonly and popularly watched. We want to try and also get you digging through the bushes a little bit to perhaps stuff you may not have seen. So in our three director's choices, um, there's no Scorsese, there's no Kubrick, there's no Tarantino, none of the huge so hard. 
or even big, big names. Um, I was surprised by Eric's choice. I'm choosing a foreign director who has done some films that you might have seen, and I had never heard of Joe's choice. I had to look him up. So just letting you know that, hopefully that brings you in rather than makes you say, oh, because you could look anywhere for Scorsese, Kubrick, and Tarantino films. You know, Woody Allen, the list goes on and on. We want to kind of shed some light on some other dudes that maybe you didn't quite know. And so mm -hmm. that's where our focus. And notice it's director's part one, you know, just like we did Western's part one. We reserve the right to re revisit these topics at a later date. You know, until I have my heart attack and keel over, I hope we're still doing this live stream. So, Listen, I absolutely love doing this live. I, I look forward to it every other Saturday. I get excited as the time gets closer. I just love coming on here, talking films with my friends, having a good time. It's just a great live. I hope we never, ever stop this. Yes, I concur. And I really appreciate you guys that are being active in the chat, man. Yeah, yeah. you guys are awesome. You know, Absolutely I, awesome. Because, you know, we take things that we see, and then behind the scenes we talk about, oh, wouldn't this be cool that so-and-so noticed or whatever, you know. And listen, uh, to you guys. Yeah, rule number one, we can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, um, to you guys being active in the chats, by the way, if you have some ideas, if you have something you would like us to do, don't be afraid to just throw it out there. Yeah. And even if we don't touch on it on screen, it doesn't mean we didn't see it. We might have seen it, and we might talk about it behind the scenes, and we'll get it out for you. Yeah, and, and Bobby, and and glad you sorry, Eric. Go ahead, Eric. Sorry. And uh, Bobby, Casey, glad you found us, man. I'm glad you saw my story about this because – you know, you're a big film buff as well. And yeah, he's made it's some fun great seeing movies. film buffs from different generations because we have those movies that were meant a lot to us from junior high, high school, college, whatever. And so when, granted, Joe and I are only a year apart, uh, talking about him, not him. I get um, to be the young guy on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're the baby. Um, but it's fun, you know, seeing like some of the stuff that Cam puts up. And that's why I'm really excited to be working with him on our week is, you know, he's at least, I don't know how old he is, but he's at least 25 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I'm really looking forward to, you know, getting behind the scenes with him and picking his brain and, you know, throwing my input and, you know, I think that little series is going to be really fun is having you guys and girls once we start getting some girls in here, which I think we will. Women love movies. Um, you know, having having you guys on and talking about movies or genres that you love, that gets me excited, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Me too. The, the audience isn't big, but, you know, Cam is in here every week. Um Casey, I hope you join us most weeks. I know it's a Saturday night. Some of you guys have lives and want to enjoy your Saturday nights at 8 p.m. at least Eastern. But uh, but getting you guys on here has always been like a, a vision of mine so we can all share and be a true community. It's not like Eric and Joe and I are experts by any means. It's just a bunch of dudes getting together, having some fun talking about one of their many passions, just like the hair in our face kind of thing. So, Well, I mean, listen, I mean, the reality is, you know, what makes me an expert about movies is I have way too much time on my hands and I sit here and watch them all eight million times in a row. Yeah. I, I just love this stuff. I do. I love the films. I love making these videos. I love doing lives. Um, I, I can't wait to do the next one. Looking forward to it. And so, Camo Cam, a uh, soundtrack episode sounds like a great idea. Yeah, it does. does sound like a good. Yeah, we're looking to there. We will press the envelopes, guys. Of you, particularly that are week in, week out. Whether you know it's a, it's something we do when we bring up here, or, or we do future. Because I really want to do more audience appreciations. I just don't want it to be the three dudes that are going to be on here first. I would like to get as many of you guys on here as possible to do that. Yeah. Those of you that are comfy with it and that are attend this chat, I would love to get you all on here to do that. Yeah. So yeah any, any, any even really filament spider web thin connection to a film that counts. <laughs> yep. two, yeah, man. Count. We don't care how it links. We're in. Right. If it's <laughs> visual entertainment, it counts and, and, and something that we all have access to. But and I, absolutely. Uh, and I talked about Tarantino soundtracks earlier, man. I yep. music is one of my big passions in life. I've been in bands my whole life and everything. And so yeah, I would love to do a soundtrack. Maybe 
okay, I'm calling it my next turn, which will be in a few months. We're going to do favorite soundtracks. There you go. See Cam, ask and you shall receive, brother. Now this Man, is. I got to start time. working on this I gotta, now. <laughs> start working on. The, good thing I got my director stuff ready because and my um, yeah. stuff ready because I got to work on that. Yeah. A couple of announcements for you film guys. Um, I'm going to plug me because I do film analysis on my channel. I'm going to plug me and Joe because we do film analysis together on my channel, and hopefully it's going to go to Joe's channel as well. So if you like that kind of stuff, I'm currently doing True Detective Season 1, a breakdown of every episode. And um, I have filmed and have ready to launch when True Detective is done, 7 and The Shining. I'm filming those as well. Um, Joe and I did Reservoir Dogs. We are hoping to, to work on a, a Spike Lee joint as our next one. Yep. Um, 25th hour to be Ed Norton lover. Eric, maybe you'll check some of those out. We're going to do the 25th hour. That's our next. We Great tried movie. late, but YouTube didn't want that to happen. Um, and remember, we're going to start rotating the channels, but the next one, which is mine, directors, will be here. And then we'll start seeing this kind of cyclical thing where we just move whosoever week it is. It's going to go on their channel so we can spread the love and hopefully get even more viewers as the people that check out Eric are not necessarily the people that check out me and Joe. And that would be great as well. Grow, grow the channel, grow the experience for everyone. Do you mind if I just plug one thing real quick, Joe? Oh, by all means. Any, you guys want to plug? Plug away. All right. Uh, just real quick, guys. You know, um, I move my live streams. Tomorrow night, we start the new live. The sit-downs on Sundays, 8 o'clock on my channel. I'm going to have a couple of content creators on with me. It's going to be a good time. Just kind of the inaugural episode. Have some fun. Get everybody settled in. And then I'll be on every Sunday at 8 o'clock on my channel. Thank each and every one of you guys. I'm getting closer to 600 by the day. I love all you guys, man. Thank you. Sounds very mafia-esque with the sit-down, Joe. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> That's, yeah, I, I caught that right off the bat. E Eric, what, what are you doing that you can let me I am going to be uh, filming and probably uploading tomorrow um, since it's cold all over the country and it's that time of year. I'm doing soups and stews. Mm. My beef most stew, recent Eric, one was beef a stew beef recipe. Soup. Yep. Well, my most recent one was a uh, potato soup recipe and it was the first cooking tutorial. They got more views than my highest reviews and it actually got over 300 views, which I think before that my highest was like 113. So that just blew me away. I, I surpassed 130 subs. Nice. So, you nice, know, brother. slow build. Um, but yeah, I'm, it's going to be fun to host, you know, every other month, you know, every couple months hosting on my channel. Um, and for those that don't know, I do cooking tutorials and then I'm going to be doing a live stream, probably starting in two to three weeks that will alternate. It'll be the same time, but it'll alternate the off weeks for beards on film. Uh, and I don't have a name for it yet. So if you have any names, it's all going to be about talking about recovery, recovery from injuries, recovery from trauma, recovery from substance abuse, uh, just to decrease the stigma around it and i started my platform to have a platform to talk about recovery because it's very Eric, important to me so that's gonna any be help stream you need any help with that brother i mean obviously not the uh, addiction phase of it and such but you said about you know injuries and surgeries yeah. and such like that you ever need a guest i'm there brother just say the word yeah I i'm just yeah. happy that Eric, you're doing something like that. I think, you know, with all these lives and things going on, to be a true community, eventually we've got to expand, you know, whether Absolutely. it's barbecuing, you know, so a bunch of beer dudes want to talk barbecue. I mean, that we can't all do the beard shit all the time, right? You know, we got to start expanding and, and moving into some different areas. And I think it's really cool to, to have that that choice that, you know, of different things to go check out. Even Chris himself said, you know, hey, this is pretty cool. I'm going to start seeing more. I'm going to start coming more often, which is great. And Casey, I hope you're in here more. Brett, you popped in. Um, I think it's it's time, boys. We went two hours. I thought we were going to go yeah. less than I, so that's good. Those of you left in the chat and for who have hung out the whole time, like Casey and uh, Cam, thank you guys so, so much. Uh, and uh, we will see you here in two weeks to talk directors. 
And uh, and then the one I'm really excited about in two more weeks, uh, our audience appreciation. That's going to be a hell of a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, man. Looking forward to it, guys. Great night. Great night, boys. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, all guys. Time. Eric, Joe, thank you. I love this. I'm going to miss it next weekend. And I'll see you guys in two weeks. Take care, everybody. Be good, guys.